Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and I am pleased to welcome back to the podcast my friend Kurt Fields. Kurt, good evening. How have you been? I'm fine, and I have been busy uh, campaigning again. Uh, spring campaigns are underway, so it's been a dynamic time, uh, and I'm fine. Now we're recording this interview on the eve of Shiloh. We've got Appomattox coming up this week. And I know in your other persona as General Grant, you've had a busy time of it lately. Yes, I uh, was at the uh, Fort Donaldson 160th back in February, just a couple of months ago. And then the last uh, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, I was at the Shiloh 160th uh, with school days Friday and uh, a lot of reenacting Saturday, Sunday. So three days on the field. And then tomorrow morning, I leave for Appomattox and I will meet General Lee once again on the front porch of the McLean house to take his surrender. Now, uh, most people, I'm sure, know of your career as the preeminent uh, living historian who does Ulysses S. Grant. But for folks who don't, um, Kurt is the guy to be Grant. And there are many Grants, many good Grants out there. But a lot of good guys do Grant. A lot of good guys do Grant. And I've had just the good fortune of kind of falling in with Kurt. And every time we start talking, it's kind of like a little bit of like old home week. And uh, as we were talking about the podcast today, we were trying to decide whether to have him in persona as Grant or in persona as himself. Um, and I really wanted to kind of pick Kurt's brain because we're really talking about Grant's uh, birthday coming up on the 27th of April. It's the bicentennial of his birth. And I thought, who better to give us some insight into Grant than a man who has to occupy Grant's shoes often? Um, so that's kind of why we're here tonight. And uh, Kurt, I'm, I'm just really glad to have you back with us. It's a pleasure to be back. I, I, I cherish my involvement with the emerging civil war. I'm humbled and honored that you reached out to me and asked me to be uh, one of the horses in the stable. Couldn't be happier. <laughs> well, as I said, it's my good fortune to have done so. So uh, the feeling is mutual. So with the, with Grant's bicentennial, the bicentennial of his birthday coming up, um, what do you think about Grant now that we've got 200 years to look back on this man and, and what he has done for our country? I think that uh, his star is once again very definitely on the ascendancy. Uh, he suffered uh, badly in the years after his presidency, and which he had a really good presidency, uh, but because he was caught between the radical Republicans and the Reconstruction Southerners seeking redemption and the rise of the lost cause, uh, he, he couldn't make anybody happy, and his eight years in the executive mansion uh, were a struggle. His second term, a lot of scandal, none of which ever would involve Grant, uh, but he, his reputation suffered. And then the Dunning School came along in the 20s and 30s, and uh I, I like to I, I like to think of uh, what uh, Chuck Calhoun, Dr. Charles W. Calhoun, said in a conversation. I've been so fortunate to have met Chuck, uh, but he said when the University of Kansas approached him several years ago to write the presidential uh, book on Grant, he said, "Let me look into it," and he spent some time during doing his basic research due diligence. And he said something that alarmed me was that the last real uh, biography or analysis of Grant had been done a full generation ago of his presidency, a full generation ago. And, and I'm paraphrasing what he said. I'm not quoting Chuck, but he, he it got the impression that uh, that last uh, analysis of his presidency said Grant was pretty much an idiot that should never have been in the White House. Uh, and uh, he said, I, I, that didn't sit well with me, that, that cast. And uh, I began digging, and I found out that quite the opposite was true. And the presidency of Ulysses S. Grant is, I don't own stock in Chuck Calhoun's books, but uh, I told Chuck that I think, it, in my opinion, it's the third volume 
uh, Grant's memoirs because it's the presidential analysis that Grant, had he had the time, would have written. Uh, and so now you've got, uh, of course, Ron Chernow's Grant, Ron White's uh, American Ulysses, and you've got uh, Charles Calhoun's The Presidency of Ulysses S. Grant. So you've got three in the last uh, five years now, 2017 to the present, that are powerhouse books that lift Grant up in a very positive and well-deserved light. Uh, and he's steadily rising 25, 30 years ago, well, let's say at the centennial of the Civil War, he was down about uh, third, second, third, fourth from the bottom. And he's in the middle, upper half, lower part of the upper half. And I, I think that in the next decade or so, uh, Ulysses S. Grant is going to be in the top 10 of our presidents and in the top five, depending on whom is rating and why they are rating. Grant uh, has always been uh, pictured, pretty much pictured as a, a dullard, and he was not, a uh, very intelligent man. And something I have found that surprised me in uh, reading and studying Grant so that I could do him in first person is that Grant had a great sense of humor. He loved to tell jokes and, and the knee slapper jokes and so forth behind closed doors when he was with family or close friends. He loved a good joke and could tell a good joke. And as I, I indicated to you once before, I think on our first interview, I said, when I, I read that, I thought, if you're at a party where Ulysses S. Grant is the life of the party, you really need to seriously consider going to another party. <laughs> but that that is the case. If uh, Grant could be the life of the party. So he's he's been shrouded uh, the first hundred years after his uh, presidency. He's been shrouded uh, in all of the myths of the lost cause and reconstruction and the bitterness of the reconstruction years. And he's finally, through some really adept scholarly work, Ron White, Ron Cherno, Charles Calhoun, and and a host of other people who are writing, really yourself included, who are writing really good books. Uh, that he's he's getting into the sunshine he so richly deserves. I think it's kind of an interesting phenomenon in that his generalship underwent a renaissance before his presidency did. I think Bruce Canton did a lot in the centennial years to really kind of open up Grant's story and introduce it to a new generation. And that kind of began the, the slow ascent for his generalship. Um, but his presidency really didn't get a good reevaluation um, until much, much later. And it's still kind of going through that process. I, I give a lot of credit to Brooks Simpson too, for the scholarship that he's done um, kind of opening uh, Grant up too. Um, so, so do you think his presidency then is going to catch up to his generalship? Oh yes, I have no doubt. I, I, I give myself some comfort zone here. I'm predicting that within a decade, you know, ten years or so, that his and you've articulated it well uh, that his presidency uh, evaluations are is going to catch up with his generalship, his uh, evaluation as a general. Because he was a he was a groundbreaker in military history. Oh yeah. He plowed he plowed a long furrow in a new field that we still our, our military still follows much of what he he told the practice. So let's talk about his generalship for for a minute. I, um, earlier today, I was actually uh, being interviewed for someone else's podcast about um, the recent emerging Civil War book, Great What Ifs of the American Civil War, and. The host of that podcast said like the, the, the what if question that he seems to be most fascinating with himself as a Civil War buff was, um, you know, what if something had happened to Grant along the way? Like what if Fort Donaldson hadn't worked out or what if Shiloh hadn't worked out? Or, you know, we can kind of go down the line on these, you know, these it's almost like there was an opportunity at every battle he fought for things to have gone wrong. And that would have meant we would not have gotten Ulysses S. Grant. But things fall into place, and we do end up with Ulysses S. Grant. Um, 
so as, as a guy who's walked those shoes, uh, tell me about that. How close were we to to not getting Ulysses S. Grant at any point? I, and, and do a presentation or several presentations uh, that I, I call Grant the ironic man. Uh, Grant should never have been able to do what he did. He should never have been where he was. Uh, he nearly drowned when he was 10 years old, pulled out of, the, of White Oak Creek by Daniel Ammon, who later became Admiral Daniel Ammon in the Navy during the Civil War. Uh, he got into West Point because of the failure of Bard Bailey, a year older, and who was uh, his school chum who lived immediately behind uh, their house. Uh, and Bart uh, flunked out of West Point. He later became a very successful doctor, but uh, Bart flunked out of West Point. And the failure of Bart Bailey, Grant's best friend, created the opening for Grant to get into the academy. And, and as, Grant, I, as I recall, the, that letter of recommendation depended on someone that, that didn't get along with Grant's dad either. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, it did, because uh, the, the, the Reader's Digest condensed version of that is when Grant was about, I almost said what I, when Grant was about four or five years old, Thomas Hamer, uh, who became Congressman Tom Hamer and uh, Jesse Grant were big debaters and, and speech makers there in the, the area around Georgetown, which in the 20s and, and 30s was pretty much the frontier uh, of America. And uh, they almost came to blows over whether or not to have a national bank and they didn't speak to each other. Well, Tom Hamer is the one that, that he, he was not uh, upset about it. Jesse Grant was the one who didn't do the speaking. And so Tom Hamer, you can't talk to somebody if they won't talk to you. So essentially they weren't speaking for years. So when Jesse wanted the appointment, he went to uh, Senator Morris and uh, of Ohio and Morris said, I'd like to help you, Jesse, but I've already done mine. But Tom Hamer has an opening, which was an oh no moment for Jesse. And so he had to simultaneously ask for forgiveness and appoint my board at the military academy. And Tom Hamer had the reputation of being such a gracious man that he was known and forgiving. And he was known as the Good Samaritan. And uh, so he said, why, well, sure, Jesse, I'll be happy. But he got the letter on the last day that he was in office. He had chosen not to run for re-election. So it, it, he had to be out of the office by that night. Yet the irony, he stopped in the middle of moving and read his mail. Now, how many people are going to do that? But he did, and he knew I've got to write this right now, or I, tomorrow after midnight, I won't be in Congress. And that's where the, the snafu with the name came up. So yet one other way that, that Grant became Grant in an in a instance where he probably shouldn't have been. Yeah, because if if Hamer had waited to the next day, like most of us would, uh, he wouldn't have been able to appoint Grant. Grant very likely, what if, uh, would not have gotten into the military academy. He, would, he didn't want to go there in, in the first place. But that's a, a big what if. And then it's at Shiloh. Uh, he was hit by a ricochet mini ball that caught him down on his left side, right below the handle of his sword and almost broke the sword in half. By the end of the afternoon, it, it had broken off, and all he had was a handle, no, no blade. And his surgeon said if, if he hadn't had the sword on, and Grant hated wearing a sword, it would have hit him in the thigh, shattered his thigh, and it would have been a fatal wound. So Grant took a hit in, uh, at Shiloh, but it, it, I, he doesn't even say, he says uh, nothing about it being bruising even. So he had uh, Halleck wanted the court martial him at Donaldson. Right. And if if Grant hadn't had Elihu Washburn as a jockey for him, who got word uh, about the pending court martial, who told Lincoln, who told Stanton, I want you to tell to email or telegraph uh, Halleck that uh, I want to know what General Grant did, where he did it, and when he did it. And of course, Halleck, they didn't call him old brains for nothing. 
Halleck said, oh, no, that's all nasty rumor as he pushes the drawers shut on, I believe, the already completed court-martial paperwork. And the other side of that is Grant's relieved of command and uh, uh, told to stay in his quarters there in Clarksville, Tennessee, on the boat. And he, he said he was a bit miffed because he didn't have a guard. He said, I don't even rate a guard. <laughs> I think about uh, when when he uh, finally crosses the river in the Vicksburg campaign and he gets to Grand Gulf and chooses to go inland instead of south to help banks. And what if he had followed orders and gone south to help banks? Uh, well, I, I mean, love to, all these moments, you know. I, I love to pull out the letter uh, that Lincoln wrote when he said, I was wrong and you were right about going north to uh, into Port Gibson instead of south to Grand Gulf, which was commanded by uh, Benjamin, I'm trying to think, it was Gar Frank Gardner. Frank Gardner graduated from the academy in Grant's class. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's the only, to my knowledge, that's the only time a sitting president ever wrote a letter to a general or anybody, but to a general saying, I was wrong and you were right. Yeah. So I always like it when I'm doing a presentation to pull that out, particularly when, when I'm with a Lincoln and say, Mr. President, let me read this to you. <laughs> uh, yeah. And of course, uh, you know, we talked a, a few minutes ago about how Grant's reputation suffers after the war and after reconstruction, um, I think in service, in poor service to the lost cause in order to prop Lee up, we've got to tear Grant down. Um, and so, you know, Grant's, prowess is overlooked in a lot of ways what would you say his greatest strengths as a general turned out to be uh, even though that prowess may have been overshadowed he i think his greatest asset if i had to say was his ability to see everything on the battlefield or specifically or a campaign generally he several different people in writing about him reference his uncanny and it it was uncanny his uncanny ability to know where everyone on the battlefield was and where they should be or go and in a campaign in the larger sense that mental uh, nimbleness and deftness of movement combined with an abiding and unshakable confidence in what he was doing, not arrogance, not unwilling to listen to anyone because he did listen to counsel. Uh, but he, it, it, uh, the objective always remained the same. How he got there may differ. And he was more than fluid about, oh, if this won't work, I look at the Overland campaign, look at that Vicksburg. It's like trying to name the seven dwarfs about all the different times he tried to get into uh, Vicksburg and finally was able to. And in fact, he says the plan he really originally thought would work uh, runs south of the batteries. And then he he uh, he goes into enemy territory and there for a few days, first three or four days, once he got across the river, he was outnumbered two to one because he had about 35,000 or so men uh, ultimately got them across the river. And uh, when Sherman got all of his over and between uh, Joe Johnston and Pemberton, they had 60,000. And uh, of course, Pemberton keeps imploring Johnston come out from uh, Jackson and let us defeat him in detail. And even Grant makes the observation. I don't recall where I read that he said it, but Grant said, if they had hit me, when in those first few days, they might indeed have been able to defeat me in detail, but they hesitated. And and he says, you know, the men who, who slavishly devote themselves to the rules of warfare are doomed to failure. And, and I really like that, you know, you call that out because I, I think one of the things I admire most about him, uh, you use the word deft, and I think that's a great description where he's not afraid to try something. And, okay, well, that didn't work. Let me try this and let me experiment. And um, he's, he's much more mentally elastic than a lot of his critics give him credit for. And, and he had a steel 
made hmm. because of course Sherman when he when he told Sherman what he was going to do, Sherman said, "You're a damn fool, and I'll have none of it." And writes a letter to Grant disavowing anything to do with the campaign, but Grant kept it and ultimately gave it back to Sherman. But Grant moves across that Mississippi River. He's out number two to one. He has no communication. It's like when the astronauts come back to Earth and that 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 burn uh, time when the heat is so intense, there's no communication. Uh, or when they're orbiting the moon and there's no communication, it's nail biting time because we have no communication. Well, Grant takes an entire United States Army into rebel territory with no communication and no supply line. So uh, Sherman is telling him, and by any logical and reasonable military thinking, Sherman was right. Grant was acting like a damn fool, according to current military thinking. But Grant was not your in the groove uh, traditional military thinker. Are there aspects about Grant that you think, uh, like what would you consider to be his weaknesses as a general? He loved too well. Uh, I'd like, I'm, I'm butchering the bard there, uh, but he, he loved too well. Grant wrote two or three different ways. The man who is my friend or who was my friend in my hours of darkness will be with me and I with him in the hours of sunshine. So the men uh, particularly who went through like Rawlins, for example, and then later on Orville Babcock, who was a prime example. Uh, but the, the man that he, he uh, had in his inner circle, he trusted implicitly, explicitly. And when he sometimes that got him in trouble, but I can't think of any instances during the war. But during his presidency, uh, Orville Babcock was the informant for the whiskey ring. Mm. And Grant defended him to the end, even after he, he fesses up and says, yeah, yeah. But Grant still stood by him, gave a deposition to Congress uh, defending him and uh, he he trusted too long. There are several people in his uh, administration that he should have said, I, I need your resignation on my desk before the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And he was wont to do that. He really hated to do that. And that cost him dearly. Uh, and I would say that may be his greatest weakness. Yeah. I was um, just talking with uh, my colleague, Chris White, the other day about, uh, I think in some regards, that's even sort of, how we can explain Billy Sherman, you know, because Sherman gets caught off guard at Shiloh, although he ends up uh, uh, redeeming himself. But, you know, he has problems at Chickasaw Bayou. He has problems at uh, Missionary Ridge. But Grant's loyalty to him sustains him to the point where he finally gets into a position where he can thrive. I mean, he pulls off an ad of, you know, a brilliant maneuvering uh, throughout the Atlanta campaign. But that's because of that loyalty that, that Grant showed him that got him to that point. That goes back to uh, Cairo, Illinois, and we were talking, I, I wanted to lift that up, but we were talking before our, the program began. Uh, of course, people who are not familiar with the area uh, and have never heard the word pronounced, uh, for the people of Illinois, it's Cairo, not, Ka not Cairo. Uh, and if you go around that area and say, uh, well, Cairo, they're going to tilt their heads and say, you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> uh, but they pronounce it care. It's, it's a K-E-H sound, Cairo, Illinois. <clears throat> but when Grant's at Cairo and trying to get Halleck to let him go into Fort Hyman and, and uh, Fort Donaldson, and he, he did Belmont back in November, now in February, January, he's trying to get Wager, Henry Wager, and it's pronounced Wager. It's not wager. In doing my Fridays with Grant, one of his descendants listens, and I'm honored, she listens regularly. And she typed in and she said, we pronounce it in the family with the hard G, Wager. Okay. It's a German name. Right. So Henry, wait, you learn something every day. Yeah. Uh, but Henry Wager Halleck is, is just shutting Grant down and saying, get out of my face, get away from me. Uh, and uh, Sherman 
is a quartermaster at that time, and he tell any outright Grant, and he told Grant, uh, "I will do anything I can to support your movements, even to uh, subordinating myself to your command." And I don't know how many times in military history that's ever happened, but when he did that, Grant had the same feeling that Lincoln did about Grant after Vicksburg. Uh, he, uh, Grant thought that uh, Sherman is my man and I am his. And uh, because Sherman demonstrated great faith and belief in Grant, and they were uh, very good friends through most of his presidency, they got crossways with each other over the Indian issue, uh, how to deal with Indians. But uh, for most, and, and then they reconciled before Grant's death. Yeah. So, and as, as I recall, you know, Sherman wasn't too fond of Grant rubbing elbows with the uh, hoity toity folks, uh, folks in New York either, you know, because that was not Grant. That's not the Grant he knew. That wasn't where Grant came from. No, it wasn't. And Grant, that's a, I, I think, a, a weakness of Grant's. He, Grant liked to associate with wealthy people and he liked to feel uh, that he was one of them to be accepted by the the wealthy and and the very more more so than the wealth the successful people because grant had been uh, a failure at everything he tried to do except being a military commander now as i couch it when i'm doing presentations and this is this is the truth uh grant uh, or i will say there are those who will tell you that I have been a failure at everything I've ever tried to do. I will tell you, I just have not been successful. And because if you look, go go out to the Northwest when he was out there, all those things he tried to do to make money that came to naught. When he came to St. Louis and tried to farm, everything he tried to do, none of it, he never made a bad decision. But conditions around peripheral to what he was trying to do negated the decisions that he made. And uh, it, it's not that he made bad decisions so much as it was when he made the decisions, what he decided to do just failed. Yeah. So he, he liked to feel that he was successful in being with the, the uh, elite of New York City and the industrial wealth of America to feel accepted by them was very important to Ulysses S. Grant. You, you mentioned that, you know, he'd, he'd not been successful at, at, at pert or anything. But one thing I, I also think he was a tremendous success is, is as a family guy. And we tend to kind of forget that he was <clears throat> crazy about Julius. She was crazy about him. The kids loved him. Um, he was really a fantastic family man. Tell me about that. Well, I think that uh, given the light of the 21st century, uh, I'd really like to see, and I, I expect in the vein of Hamilton, I'd really like to see a play, Yuli and Julie, uh, some, a musical about them. The, the John and Abigail Adams uh, story, uh, Dolly Madison and Jimmy Madison, their love story. The, the love story of Ulysses S. Grant and Julia Dent Grant is one of the greatest up there with, with uh, John and Abigail Adams in our history. Grant was not other directed. He, he did not have any need for any direction from anyone. He was a decisive commander. He knew what he wanted. He could see what he wanted and he knew how to get there. And if that didn't work, I'm going another way, but I'm getting where I'm going. And that was his persona. However, on his personal side, once he met Julia Dent, in January of 1844, it was all over. He was, <laughs> he was never, he was smitten from the first time he saw her. And uh, he was never whole after that without her. She traveled uh, uh, more than 10,000 miles during the war to be with him. And that's always with at least one and sometimes all four of their children. Uh, he, she was a support for him that he didn't need. And I know that's an oxymoronic way to say it, 
but Julia was a support for for uh, Liz Grant. He didn't need, but having it made him more than he was. It it uh, magnified him. He he became geometric in his ability, his character, and his strength when he had Julia with him. Uh, and get on the field. He 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 was a different a different man, but always the same man. And read the letters that he wrote. Always the the tenderest of letters, all through from Mexico all the way up through uh, the uh, war. Most of the war because he didn't he didn't need to write letters to her after he was with her in. Uh, St. Louis and then in uh, the White House, Washington and then the White House. But his love for her knew no bounds, no death, no height. And that my, would make a great musical. I think my favorite uh, of the letters, uh, and I can't remember the, the inspection spots that he was at, but he was inspecting forts or something along Lake Ontario. And he sends her a letter from one port and he says, oh, geez, I love you, blah, blah, blah. And then he gets the next one and he's like, I find that I love you even more now than I did at the last place I was writing from. <laughs> you know? and, and I think, you know, it's just such a personal human sort of interaction. It's wonderful. You know? And it's so wonderful that Julia kept all of those letters yeah, yeah. Uh, that we've got. What a couple of hundred of them, I guess. I, but his his love affair, his romance with Julia was his strength. That was his secret power, superpower. I think Julia. So, um, I want to just kind of circle back to uh, something you said earlier about his presidency, and you know, sort of misunderstood. And that maybe was the third volume of the memoirs that, of course, he never had the, the opportunity to write. And I've always sort of contended that his inability to write about his presidency um, is really one of the main reasons why we misunderstand it so much. Uh, and, and anybody who takes a look at the, you know, the collected personal letters of Grant that have been assembled by Mississippi, um, you know, fantastic collection. So he, he actually has a, a voluminous correspondence that we can go back to, but he never really kind of sat down and consciously wrote about his presidency. Um, how do you kind of see that and, and, you know, how does it leave that record incomplete for us? Well, I asked, uh, I, I was so fortunate to have a dinner, to be at a dinner party when uh, uh, Chuck's book was released back in November of 2018. And I, I couldn't believe how lucky I was. I was seated next to him. He was at the end of the table and I, I sit at the right hand. And I was able to talk to him and I asked him about that. Why didn't Grant write about the presidency? And he said, well, that's real simple. Grant, the only reason he was writing anything was to try to make some money for Julia mm -hmm. and, and ensure support for her. And he knew that he didn't have much time. So he had to devote what time he had to writing something that he knew people would want to read, although he seriously doubted anybody would want to read what he wrote right. and said as much to, to Sam Clemens. But he he knew he had to, to write something, we would say, commercial. And uh, that's what he, he devoted his time to doing. And, and he did it wisely because he wrote the last of it on July 16th and he died on the 23rd. He didn't have time to get into the presidency. So we have, as you've articulated, and I think, well, we have a void from the man himself about how he felt about his presidency. We don't have all these many memoirs that, that are like a blizzard once somebody leaves the White House. And uh, uh, there's, a, there's a void, there's a silence. Uh, and it hurt him, historically speaking, he was a very good writer, uh, and he did so many things in his presidency that people don't realize. He he set up the he established the Justice Department. He established what is now the National Weather Bureau. He established uh, the position of the Attorney General being the chief law enforcement officer in the land, because prior to that. 
he was the president's personal attorney. I think that the president's counselor is solicitor general is now the president's legal counsel. And the attorney general is the chief law enforcement officer in the land. And that's all Grant. Grant uh, pushed for a civil service system, uh, a, a meritocracy, entrance by uh, examination, placement, and promotion through examination and merit. Of course, that didn't go very far. Uh, Congress did grudgingly appoint a committee, but they didn't fund it, and it didn't go far. Uh, he also uh, was pushing for equal rights for women with equal pay with the men in the government as a social uh, service job, and except for the upper level. Even even he couldn't get there, and and I'm I'm not saying he even wanted to. He was a man of his time, yeah. But uh, he he tried to establish the civil service system as we, we know it today. He uh, vetoed the inflation bill, eighteen seventy four, I think it was, uh, that would have wrecked the economy, uh, and he vetoed it. Both sides of the aisle wanted it. And were astonished when he vetoed it. Yet they they couldn't get enough folks to override the veto. Uh, he established put us back on specie hard metal, uh, backing up our money, uh, and essentially the monetary system upon which our government functions to this day. And see, people don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much about what Grant did. He when he negotiated the Alabama claims. This is a a tweaker for me that that made me say, well, I'll be when I'm reading and uh, uh, again, Calhoun's book about and other books, too, uh, since then about the Alabama claims. Well, uh, part of the, the, the fine print at the bottom of the page, maybe the back of the page that nobody ever reads or knows about today is the fishing fight off the uh, shores of Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. Now, those, the Canadians and the American fishermen were shooting at each other. They had a, they had a hot war mm-hmm. going on up there off the, the coast of the uh, northeastern coast of America. And Grant, uh, in with the Alabama claims, was able to negotiate a border. And if you look at a map of North America, that line still runs diagonally off the coast of America that says the, the shows the bound the fishing boundary that that Grant had established and pushed for. Uh, and, and that's little known. In 1875, he kept us from going to war with Spain. The the Virginius affair, where this the the Cuban rebels were to there, you know, they were trying to do what uh, President Polk was doing. Polk was poking at Mexico to start a war. Well, the, the Cuban refugee or rebels down there were trying to poke the Spaniards to start a war, thinking we're going to go in with them. And uh, the Virginius, and that's a story in and of itself, but uh, the Spaniards stopped that boat and hanged, executed, they shot and hanged, I think, 52 Americans. And uh, you can imagine the outrage. Right. And the demands were flaming to go to war with Spain. And Grant managed to put that fire out. And uh, against a large public majority of thought, he, we, he kept us out of war with Spain. So, so much that he did that just isn't talked about. And a lot of it probably because he never wrote about the presidency himself, leaving that presidential void. And I kind of think of the way he bookends his own presidency, where, you know, at first he's a very reluctant candidate and he only goes because he's really trying to sort of secure what was won on the battlefield. You know, he he felt called to service. It wasn't anything he sought out. Uh, And then at the end, you know, in his final farewell message, he's basically like, well, I tried my best, you know, (laughs) and, uh, you know, sort of undersells his achievements. And, um, you know, and so. You know, with, with that kind of as a lens for looking at the presidency, I think we often overlook and forget all of the things, as you point out, that he did achieve. So. Yeah, he said that any mistakes I've made have been mistakes of, of the the heart, I think, not of the mind, uh, you know, I, I, it's not, not of intent. 
Right. And and that's you you put it well. He undersells himself. He he it's almost like Mia Culpa, forgive me for for I knew not what I did, but I did I did it with the, the, the best possible intent. Yeah. yeah. So as we look at the uh, the bicentennial of Grant's birth, what do you think is a good way for people to perhaps commemorate 200 years of Ulysses S. Grant? I would suggest, if, of course, anybody who is is watching this is a person who has a, a bent for history. And I would urge uh, anyone to celebrate it, to read those books that I have referenced, and let me reference them again. I would start with my bookshelf for the complete grant, uh, in part, would be the annotated memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant, that's put out by Mississippi State University through, I think Harvard published it, uh, but the Presidential Library edited it. John Marzalek and Louis Gallo and David Nolan did a great job. Yeah. They reference, explain every person, place, and thing that's mentioned in the book. It's, a, it's There's a whole book of information in the book that Grant wrote. And it makes all the difference in the world. Uh, and uh, I would get that. Now, Liz Samet, Dr. Samet, up at, at, who teaches at West Point, has for years, wonderful lady. I had the opportunity to meet Liz and talk with her about an hour. She, too, wrote an annotated memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant, and it is good, too. And, and uh, the annotations are different for the two of them. I mean, very different styles of annotations. So yeah. it's really worth reading both. It's worth having both. Uh, Liz goes, and I haven't had the opportunity, didn't have the opportunity to tell her this, but in looking and reading through her annotated and the presidential library annotated, hers is more esoteric and artistic. She does a lot of literary references throughout military history, uh, back through the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, a lot of excellent artwork in there that she inserts with the text that Grant wrote. It's a good book. I, I'm not by any means downing Liz Sammet's book. I have a copy of it and glad I do. But I prefer the the uh, Mississippi, the presidential library version, because it's at the hazard of sounding dull. It's a little more academic. Liz Samets is very artistic and esoteric, and the Preston to Library version is more informative and academic. But I'd read that book, and I would read uh, The Presidency of Ulysses S. Grant by Charles W. Uh, Calhoun. And uh, I would read your book, too. Give yourself a plug, because you did a great treatment of his last days there at, at the, the, the cottage. Um, there was one other one that I was thinking about. I like uh, uh, Gene Edward Smith's book, Grant. Uh, uh, Ron White, American Ulysses, uh, Ch certainly Cherno's Grant. Uh, if you read those books, Cherno's Grant, Ron White's American Ulysses, Calhoun's The Presidency of Ulysses S. Grant, uh, the presidential uh, library version of the memoirs. And of course, I, I, as, as I say this, I realize people say, my God, that's that's a, a, a PhD level of reading. It, it, you, you know, you live life one day at a time, read one book at a time. Yeah. Start with the <laughs> memoirs and, and start with the memoirs and then work through. Uh, but I would read about Grant and get some familiarity with him. There are a number of bicentennial events being held around the country. Uh, his hometown of Georgetown, Ohio, is hosting a number of events throughout the year. About uh, March 19th, I was there as uh, General Grant, and they did a This Is Your Life, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, with the local theater group portraying different people in his life. Uh, the the birthplace is having uh, in uh, Point Pleasant, Claremont County, next to Brown County, where Georgetown is in Ohio. They're having some events. The uh, Presidential Library is going to have some events through the year at uh, Mississippi State. 
The cottage is having some programming up in Wilton, New York, the McGregor Cottage. Uh, the Grant Memorial in New York City is having uh, a number of activities there that we can go to the tomb. Um, so watch a, a Google Grant Bicentennial and see what's close to you. And lift the man up in your mind. That I would say that to everybody watching. Lift up Grant in your own mind and learn something about him. Or, or learn about him. Uh, I, I, in my presentations, I tell people every, almost every time I do a presentation, I'm the least known of the best known figures in American history. You, you think you know who I am, but you don't. You don't even know what my name is. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you think it's Ulysses S. Grant. It's not. It's Hiram Ulysses Grant. Uh, that's my army issue name, Ulysses, uh, and on and on. Have a little fun with that. But Google Grant Bicentennial, see what's close to you, and uh, get the annotated memoirs and start thumbing through them. And th a good part about them is you don't have to read them start to finish. Yeah. Now, they're in two volumes. You can pick up the second volume with all war and go to the end. Yeah. But learn, learn more about Grant. He'd like it. He would, he would. And so I, and, and on that note, I kind of want to end with your presentations Fridays with Grant, uh, where you've done a series with the Civil War Roundtable Congress, where you've done first person presentations on a weekly basis, um, started by COVID and it's just kind of continued and continued and uh, been a wonderful resource. Tell us a little bit about Fridays with Grant. Well, uh, I have to give credit to that, uh, for that to Mike Mobius, who is the honcho for the Civil War Roundtable Congress, Google it. Uh, go to the Facebook page, Civil War Roundtable Congress, like it, follow it. Uh, and because uh, Mike is is doing wonderful things for Civil War Roundtables nationally. And if you uh, are in a roundtable that you feel could use a little help, contact Mike Mobius, Civil War Roundtable Congress, go there because he'll give you a shot in the arm. Uh, and he also has a number of speakers. I, I'm just one horse in the stable of many outstanding horses in the stable. And he, he's got scores of uh, Roundtable CWRT Congress programs that, like you have with this one, he's recorded them. And uh, back when the COVID lockdown occurred, he contacted me. We, we had met. And uh, although I didn't know him, I, I knew I was acquainted with him. And he said, uh, you know, I've got an idea. How about doing a program, a Zoom program, uh, live thing uh, for the, the Roundtable Congress about Grant, your topic? Yeah, sure. I'm, great idea. Uh, and see, this is back when Zoom was still pretty new. You know, we're still taking the wrapping off the box with Zoom. And uh, Mike jumped in with the technology and uh, I said, yeah, right, let's do that. We talked about some topics and how many do you want to do? And I said, I, I was passive in this issue because I didn't know where he wanted to go with it. And I said, uh, how about four? And then we'll, uh, after that, we'll see if there's any interest. It sounds like Century Magazine. I'll give you $500 to do four segments. Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we did four, and it grew to two weeks ago. I did uh, part one of the Libra Code, talking about Fr Francis Libra, who wrote it. And it was uh, CWRT Fridays with Grant number 59. 50, and all of those 59 are archived uh, there with the Roundtable Congress with scores of other people who have done some dramatic, wonderfully done programming. It's, it's a history course, Civil War history course, all at one uh, location. So Civil War Roundtable Congress, Google it, Facebook, like it, go there, learn We'll provide some resources in the uh, the links below and on the blog uh, to connect folks there. We've we've uh, uh, linked to that in the past, and we'll make sure that we link to it again because, as you say, just a fantastic resource. And uh, being able to watch you do your first person 
presentation is grand is really just uh, something incredible to behold. Uh, so, Very kind. Yeah. Uh, what about how many how many programs has ECW got archived now? You know, I of course you put me on the spot. I haven't a clue. <laughs> <laughs> you got a you have a bunch of them. We do, we do. We've got uh, podcasts and, and podcasts that go back uh, several years now at this point. But and I want to give a plug to the ECW book series that you're busily working on. How uh, how many books have you got out so far? Twenty five, uh, thirty. Yeah, in the, well, in the paperback series, I think we are um, getting ready to issue book number forty-seven, um, a biography. And I was lowballing you. Yeah, so uh, so I'm hoping that we'll break our fifty mark by the end of the year, and uh, looking forward to an upcoming biography on Ulysses S. Grant, written by yours truly, Mr. Fields. I'm, so. I'm taking away. It's slow going, but I'm taking away. <laughs> tap, tap it on the telegraph key. <laughs> Uh, well, Kurt, uh, what a pleasure it's been to chat with you and to celebrate uh, Grant's 200th birthday with you a little bit. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. Well, thank you so much for reaching out to me. You honor and humble me. Well, the, the feeling is mutual, my friend. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Emerging Civil War podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski. On behalf of Kurt Fields, we will see you online and on the battlefield.